Alright guys, welcome to lecture 8, Momentum and Impulse. Uh, here is your learning intention and success criteria. Please complete the KS table. Uh, pause the video while you complete this. Okay, so having a look through here, uh, we can see we've got a definition, we've got to calculate, and we've got an interpret. So the first thing is that this definition means we need some knowledge. We need to know what is momentum. Secondly, we need to know what is meant by impulse. However, also under this interpret, we need some knowledge in order to do this skill of interpret. So I put down here, what is a force time graph? Uh, and so we need to recognize what that is. In terms of the skills verb, we can see you've got to calculate, and this interpret is also going to be a skill we need to do. So can I calculate momentum and impulse? Secondly, can I determine area under the curve? Uh, here we've used the, just the phrasing area, but uh, area under the curve was a phrasing we used earlier on in the unit. Uh, under the curve for a force time graph. Now instead of force time in four words, I've written capital F, bracket T, saying force is a function of time. So let's pose some questions. What would you rather have hit you? A handball going at 5 metres per second, which is about 20 kilometres an hour, or a bowling ball going at 5 metres per second? Now I imagine most of you probably would have just said the handball. Well, why? Because the bowling ball is heavier. I'd much rather be hit with a small uh, ball moving at a certain speed than a much heavier ball moving at that same speed. Okay, so that's reasonable. Let's change the scenario then. Well, what if I get hit by a handball going at 5 metres per second, or a handball going at 10 metres per second, which is nearly 40 kilometres an hour? Which one are you going to choose? Now, I imagine most of you probably just said, well, I'll take the handball going at 5 metres per second, because it's not going as fast, and so it won't hit as hard. Okay, so let's mix it up again. Would you rather have a bowling ball going at 5 metres per second, or a handball going at 10 metres per second? We're trading off size for speed here. Which would you rather get hit by? And now here it's not so clear. We, we need a way to evaluate which is going to be worse to be hit by. When something hits us, we're exerting a force on it to slow it down. And if, if, we, if something hits you and then bounces off, it doesn't go at the same uh, velocity. In fact, the velocity has changed regardless of... Um, regardless of how fast it goes off you, because it has changed direction. And so if there's been a change in velocity, there's been an acceleration. If there's been an acceleration, there must be a force. Okay? Those equations we've learned to link together. And so if we think about Newton's third law, if we have done a force on the ball, then the ball has done a force on us. And, and that's what we're feeling is pain. More force, we feel more pain. And remember when we talked about forces, we talked about something called inertia of an object as it relates to its mass. But that's for things that are just still. When we're talking about moving objects, we call it momentum. Right. Now, the textbook and the syllabus um, only give us a really just an equation definition of momentum. Uh, so I'm going to give you one that's a bit more contextual to me. Uh, you might want to look at some videos to get your own contextual uh, understanding of momentum, but this is what works for me. To me, momentum is how hard it is to change the movement of an object. Okay, so momentum mean move, involves movement. If you are not moving, you have no momentum. Okay. Uh, if I have my 10 kilogram uh, bowling ball moving at 5 meters per second, uh, it's going to have a different amount of momentum to my uh, very small handball of, say, 500 grams moving at 20 meters per second. Um, but th they'll have a momentum that we can calculate, and it will depend on you know, its movement. So it depends on two things the mass, the inertia of it, how resistant to change it is, and velocity. And it has a formula. Uh, the formula is P equals M times V. Um, now, the story I've heard for why it's P for momentum is because it comes from the Latin word impetus. Now, I mean something very important in mathematics, and M is mass. So the third letter in impetus is P. Um, I don't know if it's true, but it's well, what I do it. And in this case, the unit's going to be different um, because there are two units for it. Uh, depending on the for because of the formula, we can either work this out as kilogram meters per second, or if we divide this by seconds and multiply it by seconds, you can rearrange it to get the newton second. It doesn't matter which you use. 
Okay, I'm sorry, apologies. I, I'm not going to mark you down for using this when you should use this or this when you should use this. They both, these things are identical. However, um, you should recognize that there are two different ways of units. Okay? Now, momentum is a vector. Okay? So you have to be aware of this. And if it's a vector, that means we need to give it directions. Okay? If you have a moment, you don't have a momentum of 10 kilogram meters per second. You have a momentum of 10 kilogram meters per second down if you are moving uh, down with a certain velocity and a certain mass. Um, so you've got to make sure you give directions, and that means positives and negatives like we practiced before. Now, uh, at this point, there are two things that we want to know about momentum. Okay, these are the basics. We want to know about totals and we want to know about changes. Now totals are easy. All we do is add up all the pieces and we use this symbol sigma, this Greek letter here, to represent the total or the sum of things. So when you see something like this it means add up all the p's. What is the sum of all p's? There is one trick though, you've got to consider direction. Okay, so if you've got one object going towards the right and then you've got one object going towards the left, this is going to have, let's make this positive, and this would be negative direction. So if this was positive 10 and this was negative 10, the total P would equal plus 10 plus minus 10. Well, adding a negative, same thing as subtraction, so that would be a total momentum for both these things together of zero. And normally when we're asking for totals, we're talking about systems of things, uh, two cars coming together, um, an object blowing apart, or um, something breaking up into multiple pieces, or two things coming together into one piece, something bouncing off each other, anything with any sort of collision or separation. And so just be aware of the directions. Uh, if instead I had plus 5 and minus 10, well now I would have uh, 5 plus negative 10 equals negative 5. Right. Oh no, I should have put units here as well. Seconds. I'm just doing that because I ran out of space. I could easily use kilogram meters per second. Um, so you've got to make sure that you're just careful with directions. Okay. The other thing that we do is we look at the change, okay. the change or the difference in momentum. Remember we use the symbol delta for change. Okay. Um, two things though could change here because remember we know that momentum equals um, mass times velocity. So we could change the mass or we could change the velocity. And so this formula is commonly used as well, that the change in momentum equals mass times the change in velocity. If I have something, a car bumping into another car and then slowing down, its mass didn't change unless it lost a piece of it. Uh, if I have a, an object splitting up into two pieces, um, then we might look at the mass changing, but generally we just talk about, well, um, what was happening before, what was happening after. So it's a more complex example we'll talk about in class. You can deal with changing mass, and that's what uh, rocket science is all about, or rocket physics is all about. But this one is reasonably common. Now note that this formula does not appear in your data booklet. Uh, it is quite easy to derive. Um, if you want to look, see how to do that, come and speak, to me, speak with me in class or after class. Uh, but there's no reason you can't memorize that. Remember, you can use formulas that don't appear in your data booklet, as long as you use them correctly. Okay, so don't super stress about um, memorizing them uh, because there's no reason you can't use the booklet to work these things out, but it's not a particularly difficult one to do. Okay? And so this gives us this word impulse. That change of momentum, that delta P is so important, we give it its own word rather than just saying delta P. Uh, we call it the impulse. Now Newton wrote the second law uh, of force, a uh, second law of motion, F equals MA, or A equals F divided by uh, M, on this idea of impulse. He didn't write it in terms of um, forces and masses and acceleration, he, he used this. Now I'm not going to show you how to derive it, okay? um, but it's worthwhile having a look. This gives us, though, because of Newton's second law, another equation for impulse. Impulse equals force times time. 
Unfortunately, this doesn't appear on your data booklet at all, which seems to be a bit of an um, a bit of an oversight because this is a fundamental equation that's needed to understand the next bit we're going to do in, in terms of looking at force time graphs. So you can derive this um, from first principles and from Newton's second law of motion and um, the definition of what um, acceleration actually is, but that's a bit tricky and more like B and A standard mathematics. If you're not really great, you probably just want to remember the formula. And so I'd emphasize that this is one that you really want to memorize. Okay? Um, if you're walking into an exam, remember you have two exams that count for your marks this year. If you're walking into your data test, this would be a type of exam, uh, it's a type of, what's we're looking for, equation I would memorize. Uh, walking into your final exam at the end of year 11, this would be something I'd be expecting wanting, uh, encouraging you to memorize just in case that uh, QCAA puts it on their exam at the end of the year. So it, it can be a useful formula, but it's not going to appear on your data booklet, which uh, might indicate some things to you. Okay. So let's see why this equation is useful. Uh, these are what we call force time graphs, and we can see we've got force on the y-axis, we've got time on the x-axis, same here. Now, if we consider that equation, that delta P, the change in momentum, equals force times time, okay, impulse equals force times time, then that corresponds to this area under the line. Okay, because if we have this area, that area is going to be force multiplied by time. Okay, it's exactly the same thing we did with our velocity time graphs uh, back in video 1.4, I believe. Now, uh, let's have a quick example of this. So here we've got force, the force peaks at 10. The length of time it goes for is eight, but it's a triangle. So we need base times height, so base times height divided by two, which is gonna equal 40 Newton seconds. Well, this one over here has a height of 50. The base width is five. We're gonna divide it by two because it's a triangle. And so we have uh, 25 times 5 is 125 newton seconds. So even though this one went for a lot less time, because the peak was so much taller on the axis compared to this, it had a lot more change. And this change in momentum means, well, if I know the mass, let's say that this was dealing with a 2 kilogram mass, and delta P equals M delta V, well, if I took this one, 40 equals 2 times delta V, then delta V must equal 20. So that means if I had this amount of force on a 2 kilogram mass, I would change its velocity to 20 by 20 meters per second from 0 to 8. doesn't matter what it started with, it just it would change it by 20. Uh, same thing here, um, 125, divide that by 2, would be 62.5. A change of 62.5 meters per second on a 2 kilogram object. This is why this is really useful, and if you decide to do anything with collisions in your student experiment in term 2, this would be something that would be really important for interpreting. Okay. Uh, there's a really good work example involving curved data on page 338 of your textbook. Definitely, that's a horrible light. Definitely have a look at that because it would be more like what you would see in a real experiment. Okay, so definitely worthwhile taking a look. Okay, so in this video we've learnt the following: we've defined momentum and impulse, we've interpreted the area under the curve of a force time graph, and we've seen some basic calculations for momentum and impulse. Um, make sure to check the worked examples for those in your text. Uh, for your learning slip to class, for your entrance slip, please access the own book and download uh, chapter 12.1, check your learning, and I want you to do questions 1 to 7. Please submit them on the 1.8 space on eLearn. Have a pre-read of chapter 12.2 as well before class, because we'll be covering that, and that's a little bit more of a complicated topic, so it's worthwhile having a read beforehand. Thanks very much for listening, kids. Have a good evening. Bye.